Okay, welcome everyone. Good afternoon. <clears throat> We're happy to have you with us. We have with us today, <clears throat> former trial judge Sandra Sims <clears throat> and longtime criminal defense attorney, Bill Harrison. <clears throat> and we're gonna talk some more about what's going on with injustice, inequality, and their impact on the parts of our lives that make a real difference to us. One of those today, we'll talk about what's the role and the impact of injustice and inequality on the elections as we go to the last 50 days before crucial votes. Bill, Sandra, your thoughts? Sandra, I'll let you go. That's a really, really good, it's a good question and one that I think that a lot of people are, you know, really uh, concerned about and, and, and actually they're, when in essence they really needn't necessarily be that kind of concern because I think right now we're in a place where the notion of, of there being the kinds of things that took place before the Voting Rights Act was enacted in 1964 are not necessarily occurring in that same way. There are some things that we need to take a look at and, and um, you know, kind of examine the way we do polling and that sort of thing. But I think that massive laws and procedures that inhibit people from voting prior to what happened in the Voting Rights Act doesn't exist like now. So people really ought to feel ready and capable of, of going in voting, whether it's by mail or, or, or not. And then where we do have issues to address, I mean, there are enough agencies and there are agencies and organizations that are involved in, um, you know, making certain that everyone who wants to, who everyone has the right to vote and that everyone can vote. And I think here in Hawaii, we're certainly doing something very unique with the all male all voting by mail entirely. So I think that's kind of kind of interesting. I don't know, what do you guys think about it? Yeah, I, I do, I think that it's a great uh, tool for everyone to uh, have a say in um, what goes on during the election. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there, there can't be any, any further um, question as to uh, how do I get there, um, finding time to do it, et cetera. The, all those, those issues go by the wayside because you can do this uh, and just drop it in the mail. If you want to, if you're afraid of the mail, you can go down to the these poll boxes and drop them in the poll boxes. So I think it, it opens up uh, yeah. the voting uh, you know, rights uh, to uh, everyone, uh, whether you're, you're, you're older and, and, or you're busy or what have you. And, and that's shown in the primary. So I'm really, really uh, looking forward to this general election in that yeah. regard. Yeah. In fact, for us in Hawaii, this last primary vote that was all male, we had the highest turnout for a primary that there, you know, in in years because of the ease of I, I like to think it's because of the ease of voting. But I don't know, other places are feeling more challenged than we are. But I'm 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 kind of comfortable at this point, even though there's you know lots of nays, there's a lot of noise out there about it being, you know, you know, being illegal or being rigged. I don't, I don't think that's, those are real concerns. I mean, there may be some efforts in some places to, um, you know, inhibit people or, or, you know, silence people's efforts to get out or maybe to see that that is occurring in places. But I think there are organizations like the NAACP Legal Defense Fund and other nonprofit organizations that are involved in so many communities that are making certain that everyone understands what their rights are, and that they have that ability to 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 vote, and that's, I mean, that's a that's a that's a big thing, and I, I think that's, and I'm involved with a number of organizations. It's an organization when we all vote. dot org, which I think um, um, uh, Michelle Obama has been involved with, and really really working to get young folks out to vote, and you know provide materials for that. I was on a call the other day with the links, and that's what we were talking about. Is you know when we all vote in ways that people are encouraged to vote, particularly young folks. So, yeah, that's cool. Yeah. Chuck, my, my only concern nationally is the fact that it, um, with all this fake news going on, uh, there is a tendency uh, to uh, raise issues that really aren't issues with regard to mail-in voting mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. cause people to to be concerned, uh, at least in cool. their minds, concerned about uh, uh, fraud going on and yeah. um, things of that nature. 
And, and, and that concerns me because I, I don't want the U.S. to be like other countries where we know the voting uh, is rigged and there's issues and people um, don't want to go out to vote or are afraid to vote because of the fact that they don't want to participate in a fraudulent uh, voting uh, scheme. So um, I know that there's a real push from certain segments of our society to, to make that happen so that there can be a challenge to the election results. So that's my only concern. Yeah, yeah. And that's mine too. I, I, I think about that and that's, but the reality is that it's, it can run smoothly. It can be done. And I think it's not, and even with the, you know, voting by mail and absentee, as people are saying, because we don't get the results the day of, I think the days of being able to have those, all those results in on the day of the election just may not be anymore. I think we have to expect that all the tallying is going to come you know, sometime after, because you, you know, different states have different rules about when the absentee ballots can be counted. You know, some don't allow for them to be opened and counted before, before the election, before election day. So that's stuff that can, can think about too. So uh, I'm excited about it. I'm concerned about it, but uh, I think if we are, if we are, conscientious, careful, and involved, you know, we can do this. We can do this. Well, I, think those are I don't want to be where, you know, <laughs> someone mentioned the other week about having UN observers come in <laughs> <laughs> on elections. And, it, and that's just, you know, when you thought, when, it, when I first heard it, it was like, you know, it was kind of common, but they were serious to think that we have raised the specter of there being such a possibility of there being this, this so-called rigging that we need observers. <laughs> no, you forget, Sandy, that we are a third world country here. We're heading that way. <laughs> <laughs> so those are really good points. And I think the distinction between Hawaii, where even our election commissioner acknowledged after this last primary election, that the mail-in ballots went much better, much cleaner with far fewer problems than the in-person polling had had for years before yeah. that. Yeah. So yeah. we're a good example that it can work. We know that there are groups that are really opposed to it because statistics have shown increased votes tend to concentrate in rural areas, which have tended to favor one party over the others. We know that, as Bill points out, there are serious intentional voter suppression problems going on in places on the mainland. In Georgia, they have purged, the government has purged over 200,000 people yeah. off the voter rolls as allegedly gone, missing, dead, whatever, whether that's true or not. Um, and there's no real control of that because there's nobody behind them that second guesses or checks what they've done. So we're safe here, but nationally we're not. Um, and that it presents a real problem because this is a really important election we're talking about. And uh, you know, it, our local voting may be in order, but nationally we have to be concerned that, and still be very vigilant that uh, we do things right and not allow the Voter Voting Rights Act uh, to be end run uh, by other procedures such as uh, lack of uh, a postal uh, individual. Yeah, that's yeah. just, that is just weird. I don't know where, I, yeah. is that even a real thing? I'm, you know, some days you wonder, is that a real thing? And it's hard to, and nowadays it really is hard to, to grasp because there's so much fake news out there um, through social media really? and otherwise, and then through partial news outlets. I mean, when we were growing up, we knew that there were some certain newspapers and, and news media that was partial, but nowadays you really have to be concerned uh, as to partiality on um, all fronts so that, you know, so that that changes what we uh, understand and gets filtered mm -hmm. as to what we learn. Uh, is happening. So that's the scary part. Yeah, because you have to kind of look at your source when you're saying a new news source. You really have to look at where, what that source is. Uh, I know I always do. I, before I decide that something really is, it's like, wait, let me, who is this? <laughs> who 
who, that, that who raises, is this? <laughs> yeah, that raises another really critical point, which is if we really went by a one person, one vote system, eh, mail problems, in-person problems would kind of come out as a wash and it probably wouldn't make that much difference. I mean, the last election, there was a margin of close to 3 million votes. So even if half of those were questioned, you still got a million and a half vote margin, but we don't. We've got a system that was developed by a society whose constitution is designed for a democratic republic, but whose voting system is designed for a very limited electorate. Yeah. At the yeah. time of our yeah. founding, at the time of our constitution, not even close to everyone had the right to vote. Women could not, slaves could not. Mm -hmm. People who were not essentially landed gentry right. had serious right. problems. Right. It was set up that way. And so the electoral college vestigial system that we have now favors geographical area and rural communities heavily over concentrated urban communities. It has not adapted to yeah. the over 200 years of change in the concentration of the population. So we've now had two elections where the popular vote loser by substantial margin Mm -hmm. wound up being the electoral college winner. Clearly that is the objective of the party that is not doing well in the polls right now. And those swing states that can make that electoral college difference are where the effort, efforts to concentrate voter suppression, voter deregistration, mm -hmm. voter discouragement, all those things are happening. The, the, the Georgias, Floridas, Texas, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, mm -hmm. Michigan. Yeah, as you say, that, that whole system, the Electoral College, um, basically was set up uh, to uh, help a specific portion of our population and really is the basis initially for systemic discrimination. Um, you know mm -hmm. what's going to happen with that system, and they set it up that way. They did not want people who they believe did not uh, share their viewpoint um, to be allowed to to participate in their party politics. And so we go back back to uh, what we started out this conversation about is e inequality and discrimination. It starts right there. Mm -hmm. We're talking about mm -hmm. elections is that electoral mm -hmm. college system. And that's a really good point, Bill, because that electoral college system was a product of a group of people, none of whom were elected representatives of colonies. Yeah. They were kind of self-designated and every one of them was part of a specific power elite at that point in time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and it's interesting that as the country gradually moved, probably more through the influence of Lincoln than any other mm -hmm. single president, toward a more egalitarian electoral system, a more balanced one, that the counter push over the last few decades from Reagan's time on mm -hmm. has been to reconcentrate the power and the wealth in electoral control and to use that for gerrymandering, for voter suppression, for taking people off the voter mm -hmm. rolls, mm -hmm. for making registration more difficult. We've all seen examples during our lifetime of people who tried to register to vote who, because they had not memorized the chief clerk of each county of their state, <laughs> were refused the opportunity to do that. Yeah. This oh, yeah, is not 100 years ago. No, it's not. It's, it's, it's in our lifetimes. I, I was, you know, looking at the, the, the life of Fannie Lou Hammer and, uh, in a recent uh, web, webinar that I was involved in, and the things that she talked about in, in that effort to really, really move the, to move the ability of people to vote, to fight voter suppression in, in Mississippi was just phenomenal. This is a woman who was like literally beaten, literally beaten um, 
as she pursued the, the, the right to vote. Uh, you may remember, well, maybe not vividly, but you know, basically the, the Mississippi um, uh, challenged party basically storming the Democratic convention in, uh, what was it, 68 or 72, to be seated. Um, uh, which was which was you know part and parcel why we had to have that voting rights act. So when you look at what folks like her did, I mean to just totally sacrifice them their bodies, their lives uh, to do this. And then we look at there's still these kinds of efforts to suppress still going on. Not not maybe in the same way. Nobody is I hope not beating anyone up, you know who's coming to the polls. But we're certainly uh, having to be mindful and careful. Um, about some of the suppression things that are coming up in some of those areas that you mentioned, Chuck. And um, I, but I think there's also more education and more involvement, particularly, and I keep going back to this, particularly with our young folks who are really, really uh, this time maybe more engaged than ever. Uh, that, well, not ever, because I think we saw that kind of movement in civil rights as well. But when you think about it, you know, this is a generation, the, the what do you call them, the, the Ys or the Zs or whichever ones they call themselves. Um, this is a generation who number one, grew up with a Barack Obama as their president. So the notion of, you know, there being someone who is of, of color in the president's office is, yeah, that's just how it is. But it's also a generation that, you know, grew up with the specter of of being shot at while you're at school, which is something that you know for for us was you know the biggest thing you had to fear was to you know the three o'clock you know fight in the in the in the playground or something if there was such a thing. Um, but those are the kinds of things that they're having to face for real. Um, and, you know, with the gender issues that they're having to address as well, um, issues with regard to, you know, growing, coming out of foster care into adulthood. So this is a generation that's, you know, lived through a lot, uh, seen, has seen a lot, and then are coming into their own to try to understand this system. And I don't know that we've done such a great job of even explaining what that, why that electoral system is there to most folks, because most people just don't really understand it, why in the world is there, what it's for. They don't get it and, and not really understanding that it needs to be changed. Whereas I think there's a generational shift that is saying it's going to change. Yeah. yeah. I kind of feel like this is where that move is coming from, much in the same way that, you know, the young people were involved in civil rights. We're kind of kind of seeing that, hopefully, uh, as well. I, I think I maybe got more faith in the young people than most people do. <laughs> no, no, Sandy. I, and I'm, I'm also heartened at the, um, the fact that our young people uh, have sort of woken up uh, to this issue of elections and uh, voicing their opinions and exercising their First Amendment rights. Um, for a long time, for many years, we didn't have that. There was so much apathy with the young people. Yes, the, yes. The 60s movement that we grew up in, that was a time of change. And we all uh, understood that, and we all took the stands and positions on different things, and we voiced our, our, uh, you know, attitudes and opinions, and um, went to the polls and we voted and we did all those wonderful things. And then there was a a big lag of time mm -hmm. where maybe we coddled our kids too much. I don't know what it is. Uh, I can't say, but <laughs> but I'm seeing a reawakening now, and, it, and it, it's really so. it really is um, something that we can look forward to, and and uh, hopefully we'll make. Uh, uh, substantial changes in, in the way we go forward from here on out. So, Bill, does that, and Sandra, does that bring us back to that really important point you raised earlier, which is we may never have seen a campaign of misinformation as extensive, as expensive, as strategically organized and structured as what we saw in 2016 and what we're seeing exponentially greater now, not just clearly and documented from Russia and other sources, but from particularly one of the parties. Yeah, I, How did the young people deal with that? How do they 
master objectively reliable choice? That, that, I think that's a, a, a really important uh, question that we have to, to look at and um, this new generation has to look at. Because you remember back in um, the 60s when uh, JFK became the first president to use the, the television to really um, go out and talk to people and get his mm -hmm. points across mm -hmm. and gather, gather people. Um, the, the, you know, the recent administrations, they understood the power of social media and they have now yes. grasped onto it and understand that this whole group of young folks have grown up in that social media. They haven't grown up in the television. They haven't grown up how we grew up on, right. you know, going outside, talking to one, one another in a town square. Um, so they really have mastered this, this uh, social media platform. They've got those very, very bright young people around them telling them that this is where you have to focus your attention. And uh, we were amazed at our executive using tweets. Um, and we say, how could you, I mean, how on earth could someone ever believe you or, you know, uh, look up to you when you're doing this? And yet he's got millions of followers, you know, uh, hundreds of millions of people are listening to him. Uh, and it's, it's, it's scary in that respect. So we really have to figure out how um, everyone who, who's in, involved in the, um, the electoral process, how to educate um, and, and make these younger folks understand that, that this tool that they're using is too easily abused. And, and that's a concern. Yeah, it, it is subject to that. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's a good point too. I'm not... so, so where do voters, especially young voters, look for reliable, objective truth to make their electoral choices? What needs to happen to give that truth to them in ways that are both accessible and reliable? Is there a media failure here that is part of the problem? That's part of it. That's definitely part of it. But but I think I, it goes back to what Sandy said earlier on. When she sees something, she looks, checks it out. One, one amazing thing about the about the internet is that it's so vast, and so you can almost find information on every subject and everybody. Um, and so you have to do your homework. Uh, you know, we have to make sure that that these uh, young millennials really do their homework and not just take what first comes off. The, the you know the, the, instead of the ticker tape the the, the you know Twitter tape and Twitter tape. It as uh, <laughs> as valid right um, we have to do our homework and um, I, I'm hopeful that and it's our responsibility you know to teach our kids and our grandkids to do that uh, yeah. and so the responsibility uh, then falls back on us as well and, and not to let let this go without making and and probably teaching mm -hmm. like our grandparents taught us you know, and reading the newspapers and listening to the news and listening to the radio, you know, we have to be objective and, and uh, you know, we have to, to keep our uh, inquisitiveness going on and, uh, and make sure we do our homework. Yeah. And so let me ask you folks, who, what may be a scarier question. We know that you folks are younger than me, but in our general time period, that there was a level of mistrust and opposition and questioning of elders and of authority. One of the things back in the 60s that was a kind of a catchphrase was don't trust anybody over 30, right? <laughs> exactly. Okay. So let's assume that there is some element of that that is a natural part of youth's resistance to and questioning of authority. The scary question is, has the Republican Party and have Trump been able to turn that concept on its head in their favor by claiming to be the ones who challenge the traditional old boy authority? Yeah, I, you know, I, go ahead, Sandra, go ahead. That's a good one. I, I, I'm, I'm not quite sure. I mean, there's an, certainly an ostensible attempt to do that, but... Uh, I, I, I still go back to this position of having a bit more um, uh, faith in the discernment and intelligence of this younger generation. It is a questioning generation, yes. 
Uh, and it's it's certainly ones that, you know, they raise some of the same kind of concerns and questions we have, but at the same time, their ability to do more independent kind of thinking because they have access to more resources. Yeah. You know, and the thing is, is as, as I brought up earlier, the uh, this new political movement, um, they have capitalized on the fact that being different means acting different, speaking different. Uh, and they really have capitalized on that. You know, when in our lifetimes or anyone's lifetimes, would you have a president, the you know, chief executive uh, speaking the way he does, tweeting the way he does? Um, and he's separating himself from the, the older folks, the older generation, the old school, um, and, and how they did business and politics. So he has really understood and capitalized, or the smart people around him have understood and capitalized, that that sets him apart from the old guard and makes him more uh, enticing to this new generation who don't want politicians anymore. They want people who are gonna do things. And they see politics as these group of old folks getting together, having fun amongst themselves, gaining you know, um, riches on the backs of other folks. And they don't want that anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so coming into our last minute, any wrap up thoughts, Sandra? I think we're going to be okay. What makes you believe that? I think deep down, deep underneath all of the noise that we are hearing, there is, I think, within, with many of, within people, a, an ability to be more discerning than we're giving folks credit for. I yeah. do believe that. And, and I absolutely I, believe that. And just yeah. because there's a poll, I think I'm getting to the place of, you know, polls being meaningless because I'm not sure that everyone even responds to that. Yeah. Um, and so, I agree. I agree totally with, with Sandra. And I think it's just basically, there is a now a movement for the goodness of, of people. We're looking yeah. towards the good of people. And I think that that uh, will, will carry us uh, through this election. I, 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 I think so. I think so. I, I really think there's this undercurrent of, People who are just, you know, concerned about each other more. And 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 this pandemic has aided that too in some ways. That's I correct. think it's made us more uh, inward directed, caring directed, looking at one another, looking out for one another. And in that, maybe even in, in enhance some of our abilities to communicate better with each other that we're not necessarily seeing in a media setting. So, you know, I, I I mean, it's, it looks scary at times, but I think we're going to be okay. There is hope. We'll wrap it up. Do the right thing for all of us. <laughs>